على الكتاب والسنة واتباع السلف الصالح. So we worship Allah based on knowledge. Why else should we seek knowledge? Yes, uh, Sheikh. So we know how to handle the tribulations of conflict. Good. So we are living in a time where the scholars are few, but the speakers are many, and there's a lot of misguidance. And there's lots of people saying my way is the right way and they will give you Quran, they will give you a hadith and if you don't know the right from the wrong you're going to be misled. It's exactly like Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah mentioned that if you don't have knowledge of something somebody can bring you dirt or dust and you think that it's gold. Just because of the color, it's that yellowy color. If you don't know, he brings it to you, says this is gold, and you believe him because you don't have the tools to distinguish right from wrong. Why else should we seek knowledge? Yes, Sahih. Atheism was also spreading. Uh, Excellent. Like teaching like big bang theories and things that don't really. Wa jazakumullah khaira, because the atheists. And the people who are enemies of Al-Islam, there has never ever been a time, you young brothers, there has never been a time in history where the people of Ilhad, the people of atheism, they are pushing their theories now more vigorously than they ever have before. It's never ever been at this level that it is right now. So it's so important we learn about our creed because if we are not grounded in our religion, then when the doubts come to us and the misguidance comes to us, we're going to fall down. And I give you the example of a, a building and the building is really beautiful, but it has weak foundations. The second that the wind starts to blow, the whole building is going to come tumbling down. Your aqeedah, your creed, learning about your, uh, the fundamentals of Al-Islam, this is the foundations of your religion. Firstly, we need to know that learning about the religion of Allah is an act of worship. So we're not here to go back and boast about other, boast to other people. First and foremost, we're doing it for the pleasure of Allah. Secondly, we want to raise off ignorance off of ourselves because we said we can't worship Allah based on ignorance. So we want to, this lack of knowledge that we have, we want to increase our knowledge and then we want to go back and teach our wives, teach our parents, teach our children, teach our friends. So that's the correct intention. We said about the student of knowledge, he has to fulfill six conditions. And we said with regards to himself, with regards to his friends, with regards to the place, with regards to the teacher, with regards to the books, with regards to the knowledge. These are the six things that have a right over the student of knowledge. So with regards to himself, what did we say? We said he comes in and he is sincere with a good intention. He comes in ready to seek knowledge. He comes in with the correct manners and the correct etiquettes. Even he comes in and he's dressed in the appropriate way to sit in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Doesn't have smelly feet or smelly clothes. He doesn't, he's not unkempt, dirty. He comes and he's clean. He comes and he's clean and he's ready to learn and he has the correct intention. Then with his friends, his companions, you brothers, we're all on a journey, subhanAllah. What you need to remember, that remember what we said, الرَّحْمَةِ that the mercy, it envelops them. وَحَفَّتْهُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ And the angels surround them. And then when they go back up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah jalla wa ala, he asks them, where did you come from? And then they tell him, we came from some of your slaves. They want your Jannah. They want to stay away from your hellfire. And Allah says, I have saved them from the hellfire and I've given them that Jannah. And Allah, وَذَكَرَهُمُ اللَّهُ مَنْ عِنْدَهُ And Allah, He remembers them with those who are with Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the way we are remembering Allah Jalla wa ala right now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is remembering us, mentioning our names, boasting about us bi-idhnillah to the angels who are around him subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is a great noble thing, okay? So you brothers, we're all on a journey together, seeking the pleasure of Allah, seeking Jannah, trying to stay away from the hellfire. Ultimately, that's what it's all about. And so we have a right over one another. 
we help one another cooperate in righteousness and piety don't cooperate in sin and transgression the place the masjid a house from the houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places where there are angels and the shayateen don't enter these places places which we should keep clean and we should have the correct manners and the correct etiquettes and I mentioned to you brothers last time when you come into the masjid before you sit down pray two rakahs this is the two rakahs known as the tahiyatul masjid the greeting for the masjid and we shouldn't sit down until we've prayed those two rakahs as the Prophet ﷺ told us the books and the teacher and the knowledge and I think this is all fairly self-explanatory the knowledge we take it down we write it down we learn it we implement it as for the teacher we respect him we don't give him a position higher than he deserves but at the same time we have the correct manners and the correct etiquettes then brothers we looked at the beginning of the creation because I said we need to get our bearings right when we're looking at Aqeedah we need to look at how did this battle between the shaitan and the children of Adam how did this battle begin and we mentioned that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he created Adam alayhi salam and he ordered the angels to prostrate فَسَجَدُوا إِلَّا Iblis, but they all prostrated except for Iblis was Iblis an angel, brothers? No. Iblis was actually a pious worshipper of Allah. But why didn't Iblis? Why didn't Iblis prostrate? Who can tell me? One of the Go on, Pride and arrogance. Pride and arrogance. What did he say? Ana khayrum min. What did he say? I'm better than him. You created me from the fire, and you created him from the clay. So Iblis, he became arrogant. And what did I say? A real world example of the people who are following this type of sunnah. What is it? One of you young brothers, you three. We said, were you here? I know two of you were here at least. Iblis, he said, I am better than him. I'm not going to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What did we say? Racism, do you remember? We spoke about racism and how racism when a person thinks he is better than somebody else simply because of his lineage or simply because of his origin then you are following the way and the path and the footsteps of Iblis who simply said I'm better than him because I come from the fire and he comes from the, uh, from the clay. Just like the one who says an Arab he is better than a non-Arab or this caste is better than that caste all of this is not from the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Iblis, after he refused to prostrate, Iblis was cursed and he was sent astray. He said, Oh Allah, let me stay alive until Yawm Qiyamah. And then Allah said, You're going to stay alive, I've given you that wish. You can stay alive until Yawm Qiyamah. Iblis said, Oh Allah, because you have sent me astray, I'm going to sit for them and I'm going to wait on your straight path. And I'm going to come from them, from their right and their left, and from in front of them and from behind them. And you're going to find that most of them, they're not grateful. Meaning I'm going to mislead them. And I said to you brothers, look, don't think that your path to seeking knowledge is going to be easy. Shaitan, he doesn't want you to be here right now. This is the reality. Shaitan wants to you to be at home watching TV, the internet, out with friends, whatever it is. He doesn't want you to be here seeking knowledge. He doesn't want you to be learning about your religion. He doesn't want the angels to be around you. He wants you to be in the places where he wants you to be, the places of filth, the places where Allah is not remembered, the places where Allah is disobeyed. He doesn't want you to be in the masjid. And so I said to you guys, you're going to face problems, you're going to face trials, coming to these lessons even. Forget even coming to the straight path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even coming to these lessons is going to whisper to you, oh, you're tired today, you've got work tomorrow, you've got uh, school, you've got, co you've got exams, whatever it is. But subhanAllah, we see we spend more time on Facebook, spend one hour less on Facebook and you can come and benefit from this. And there you have your time and you haven't used up any excess time. So Iblis, he came and he declared enmity to Adam and the children of Adam. Oh Allah, I'm going to mislead them all. So do you know what he did? He came to who? Adam and his wife, Hawa. And what did he say? You know that forbidden tree which Allah has not allowed you to eat from. You've got all of Jannah, but you can't eat from that one tree. 
Why did Iblis, or what was the reason Iblis gave? If you eat from this tree, you're going to be one of two things. What did Iblis say? Angels, good. You will be from amongst the noble angels or, or, or and you will, you will live forever. Excellent. Barakallahu feekum. But what's the ironic thing? What's the ironic thing? I said, look how Iblis misleads a man. They were in Jannah anyway. Is there death in Jannah? No. And why are they better than the angels? Because the angels prostrated to them. So Allah gave them a rank better than the angels. Why would you want to be from the angels? Allah has given you a rank better than them. Why would you want to be immortal or claim immortality? You're living in Jannah, there's no death anyway. But Iblis, look how he comes to a person and he misleads them. So they ate from that tree and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he sent them down into this dunya. And we spoke about evolution and how evolution is absolutely not compatible with Al-Islam. Absolutely, there is no compatibility with Al-Islam. Allah Jalla wa Ala, He created Adam with His own two hands and I mentioned the ayah to you. And He created him as a man and He sent him down from the Jannah as a man. He was never an ape. He was never a half ape, half man. He was created as a man in Jannah. He was sent down to the dunya as a Jannah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about the enmity of, Al, uh, of uh, Iblis to the Muslims. And this is where we are now, ya ikhwan. Now the question arises. The people, Adam and Hawa, they came down, they were worshipping Allah. We all agree. Do we all agree? And initially, mankind, they were one nation, all of them were upon Tawheed. Because now you need to get into your mind, how did we get to this stage where people started worshipping others besides Allah? How did this happen? Again, we're just getting our bearings. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, Ayah number 213 Mankind was one nation And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent prophets as glad tidings or givers of glad tidings and as warners so mankind was upon one nation and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent prophets with glad tidings and as warners. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, he said there were 10 generations, listen very carefully. He said there were 10 generations between Adam and Nuh alayhi salam. So the Prophet Adam and the Messenger Nuh alayhi salam, there were 10 generations between them. All of them were upon the religion of truth. They later disputed. So Allah sent the prophets as warners and as givers of glad tidings. Ten generations, brothers, okay? So Adam alayhi salam until Nuh alayhi salam. Ten generations, all of them are upon Tawheed. All of them are worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not associating any partners with Allah in any way, shape or form. Now, what happens after this? How did they go astray? Those ten generations, brothers, all of them are worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Suddenly they start worshipping idols. Did somebody suddenly wake up one day and say, you know what, I'm going to build an idol and we're going to worship the idol. The answer is absolutely not. The answer is absolutely not. What did they say? The people of Nuh alayhi salam. When Nuh came to them, and he called them, worship Allah. Why are you worshipping others besides Allah? Look what they said, وَقَالُوا And his people, they said, لَا تَذَرُنَّ آلِهَتَكُمْ Don't leave your idols. These idols, don't leave your idols. So, Adam alayhi salam, the people are worshipping Allah. Ten generations of people are worshipping Allah. Suddenly, Nuh alayhi salam, the prophet Noah, he comes and the people are worshipping idols. Allah mentions this in the Quran. They say, don't leave your gods, don't leave your idols. 
What did they say? Wala tadharunna and don't leave. Wadda. Wad is the name of a god. Wala suwa'a. This is the name of a god. Wala yaghuth. This is the name of a god. Wala ya'uq. This is the name of a god. Wala nasra. Wa nasra. This is the name of a god. So they said, don't leave your five gods. Now the question is, who are these five gods? Who are these five idols? Ya Ikhwan, Subhanallah. Ibn Abbas, he says, these names that we've just mentioned, Wadd and Yaghuth and Ya'uq and Nasr, these are the names of five righteous men who were from the people of Nuh alayhi salam. Look at this now. When they died, when these men died, they were pious worshippers of Allah. Did these men make idols? No. They were worshippers of Allah. But when these people died, Shaytan, he came and he whispered to their people. And he said, make statues of these men and put them in your gathering places. Put them in your places of meeting. Put them in your town hall. Put them in your city center. Put them in your places of worship. Because when you see their statues, what's going to happen? You're going to remember how pious they were. That's going to make you want to worship Allah. Do you see? The intention is good. Shaitan, he comes with a whispering, but the intention is good. Make these idols. When you people see them, who are you going to worship? Who are you going to worship? Allah. Shaitan is coming to them and saying, when you see the idols, you'll worship Allah. But you know what happened, brothers? They made the idols. And when they used to see them, they used to worship Allah. But their children who grew up after them, Shaitan came to them and he said, you know, your forefathers used to worship those idols. And so those children, the next generation, they grew up worshiping the idols. And in fact, when the Prophet wasallam, thousands, millions of years, even Allahu Alam, came much later, these five idols, they were from the 360 idols that were in the Kaaba at the time, these five idols were still there. These five idols, the pagans of Quraysh, they were still there from the time of Nuh alayhi salam. Brothers, look. This shows you the dangers of innovation. The dangers of innovation. Somebody tell me, why does this show you the danger of innovation? Why does it show you the danger of doing something new that your predecessors didn't do? Doing something and adding something that has not been legislated in the religion. Why is this an evidence for the dangers of innovation? Yes, Akhi. It starts something small that you perceive to be good, but every generation will get worse and worse. And worse. Barakallahu feek. They started, look, the generations before, did they have these idols? No. Did they worship Allah and remember Allah when they saw these idols? No. Shaitan, he came and he gave them a thought which they thought was good, but they added something to their way, to their religion with good intention. With good intention. But it wasn't part of the religion. It hadn't been legislated. And so look how a little change, eventually it led to partners being associated with Allah in this dunya. That little change, it led to others being worshipped besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tell me something else that we learn. Shaitan has long-term plots. His plans, not like ours, a five-year plan and a ten-year plan or a one-year plan. Some of us don't know what we've got planned for the next three months or even the next week. Shaitan, he comes with long-term plans. He says, right. I'm going to lay this trap. It's a small one. Then the next one is a little bit bigger. And then the next one is bigger and bigger and bigger until eventually the person leaves the fold of Al-Islam. So Shaitan, he comes with long-term plots, long-term plans. He waited two generations, two whole generations. And then he got his way and the people began worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Going overboard in the remembrance of the dead is one of the avenues which leads to shirk. This is another thing we learn from this. 
You know when a person he dies and the people go overboard in remembering him. They fall into exaggeration and they keep going and going and going until eventually some people might begin to worship that dead person. So brothers, now we have learned how shirk it occurred in the dunya. From the people being upon the worship of Allah, then shirk occurred because the people, they deviated ever so slightly, they innovated, they left the way of their righteous predecessors and they followed the plots and the plans of the shaitan. So now there is a need to call the people back to the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now there is a need for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send prophets and messengers in order to say to their people, worship Allah and don't stay away and, and don't worship others besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This brothers, teaching people the correct creed. What do we believe? What do we need to understand? This is known as aqeedah. Okay, aqeedah. So when you hear the word aqeedah, you need to know what does aqeedah mean. Okay, it comes from aqada yu'aqidu. When something is firmly tied, something is knotted, this is the linguistic meaning of aqeedah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Allah is not going to hold you to account for those things from your oaths that you don't mean. But he's going to hold you to account between the oaths that you have firmly tied in your hearts, meaning the oaths that you make and you genuinely hold them, then you're going to be held to account, meaning you have firm intention when you make that oath. That's the linguistic meaning. But when we're talking about aqeedah, what are we talking about? The definition which I want you guys to learn and understand. So when somebody talks about aqeedah in the Jummah khutbah or whatever, you know what we're talking about. It refers to the matters which are believed in. It refers to those matters which are believed in with certainty and conviction. And so before we teach the people about the prayer, we need to teach the people, what do you need to believe about the one who you're worshipping? What do you believe about the one who created you? Because brothers, Many of us, if not all of us here, we were born into Muslim families. But did anybody sit us down and say, this is what you have to believe about Allah. This is what you have to believe about Al-Islam. This is what you have to believe about the angels. This is what you have to believe about X and Y and Z. And this is why we have this course now. Because so many of us grew up in Muslim families, but we don't know the basics, the fundamental things that we need to know as Muslims. And so, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةِ الرَّسُولًا أَنْ يَعْبُدُ اللَّهِ وَاجْتَنِبُ الطَّاغُوتِ Allah says, we sent Surah number 16, Ayah number 36. He says, we sent to every nation a messenger saying what? Worship Allah and stay away from anything which is worshipped besides Him. This is the core of their message, brothers, subhanAllah. The core of every single prophet and messenger who came was what? O oh people, stop worshipping others besides Allah. Don't worship the graves. Don't worship the idols. Don't worship the stars. Don't worship the trees. Don't worship the sun or the moon. Don't worship your kings. Worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Allah Jalla wa ala, He says to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا نُوحِي إِلَيْهِ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنَا فَاعْبُدُونَ Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says in Surah Al-Anbiya, uh, Ayah number 25, And we did not send before you, we did not send before you any messenger except that we said to him, None has the right to be worshipped but me, so worship me. Look, Allah is telling us, all of the prophets and messengers, this was their mission. Worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَلَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا نُوحًا إِلَىٰ قَوْمِهِ إِنِّي لَكُمْ نَذِيرٌ مُّبِينٌ Allah says, and we sent Nuh to his people, saying, I'm a plain warner to you people. I'm a clear warner to people. أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا اللَّهِ That you don't worship 
anyone but Allah. So when those people were worshipping those five idols, which we spoke about just now, Nuh, he came and he said, look, I'm coming to you with a clear, plain message. Don't make me a king. I don't want your money. I don't want your power. All I want from you is that you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And then what did he say? Inni akhafu alaykum adhaba yawmin aneem. I fear for you the punishment, the torment of a painful day. I fear that day when you're going to stand in front of Allah, you're going to get questioned about why you worshipped others besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ibrahim alayhi salam, he said, if qala li qawmihi abudullaha wattaqu. And remember when Ibrahim said to his people, worship Allah and fear him. ذَلِكُمْ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ This is better for you if only you knew. When Musa went to Fir'aun, قَالَ فَمَنْ رَبُّكُمَا يَا مُوسَى Pharaoh said to Musa and Harun, his brother, both of them being prophets, Who is your Lord, O Musa? Musa said, قَالَ رَبُّنَا الَّذِي أَعْطَى كُلَّ شَيْءٍ خَلْقَهُ ثُمَّ هَدَى That Allah, my Lord, our Lord, is the one who created everything and He gave it its form and its nature and then He guided it to the straight path. Isa alayhi salam, the one who the people worship as a son to Allah jalla wa ala, He said, وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ رَبِّي وَرَبُّكُمْ فَاعْبُدُوهُ And indeed, Allah is my Lord and your Lord, so worship Him alone. The reason why I'm bringing you this ya Ikhwan, is so I'm just giving you parts of the Qur'an, just snippets, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions various messengers, and He tells us that they came to their people with that same message. Worship Allah, stay away from associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The messengers came with Tawheed. But now we need to know what's the meaning of Tawheed. What does Tawheed mean? What is a Tawheed? Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was sent with Tawheed. Every Prophet who came before him was sent with Tawheed. But what does Tawheed mean? So it's so important for us to define our terms. We spoke about Aqeedah and we said, what does Aqeedah mean? Now we need to look at Tawheed. What is Tawheed? So linguistically, Ya Ikhwan, in terms of the Arabic language, it comes from the verb Wahada Yuwahidu, to make something one. So if we say Yuwahidu Turuk, it means there were various ways and he made all of the ways into one way. Okay? So it means to make something one. Okay, but when it comes, this is just linguistically, but in terms of when we're talking about Tawheed that the messengers were sent with, it means to believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is alone without any partners or any associates in His Lordship, in His names and attributes and in His worship. So to believe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one without any partners in his lordship, in his names, and in his attributes, and in his worship. And I need you guys to all, whether you're writing down or you're not writing down, you need to memorize this. That Tawheed is to believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is alone without any partners in his lordship, in his names and in his attributes and in his worship subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or if you want to make it really easy, you just say we have to recognize and maintain the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all aspects of our life. All aspects of our life, we recognize and maintain the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Isn't this the reason why you were created, Ya Abdullah? This is the reason why we were created. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I did not create jinn and mankind, except that they should worship me alone. So when you recognize Tawheed, I am here, and I recognize Allah has no partners in any way, shape or form, then you recognize the reason for your creation. 
Now here's a question for you. This Tawheed that we're talking about, the study of Tawheed that we are addressing, how did it develop? How did the study of a Tawheed develop? Did the Prophet wasallam sit his companions down and say, this is Tawheed, this is Aqeedah, or was it something that was later developed in order to protect the creed of Al-Islam? What you need to know, Ya Ikhwan, is that at the time of the Prophet wasallam and his companions, there was no need for the Messenger of Allah wasallam to do what? To sit his companions down and explain to him Tawheed because they understood it in its fullest sense. There was no need to try and sit them down and explain to them this is Tawheed, this is Aqeedah because why? The companions understood it as a whole. I have a question for you. We have a science of Hadith. This Hadith is Sahih. This hadith is Hassan, this hadith is Da'if, this hadith is authentic, this hadith is good, this one is weak and rejected. Was this around at the time of the Prophet ﷺ? No, there was no need for this science. Just like this, the science of fiqh, this is fard, this is obligatory, this is mustahab, this is recommended, this is mubah, this is permissible, this is makruh, this is di disliked, this is haram, this is impermissible. Was this around at the time of the Prophet ﷺ? There was no need. The companions understood the religion as a whole. Then what happened, Ya Ikhwan? As the Muslim lands, they increased massively in size because the companions, they were conquering vast areas radiallahu anhum. Do you know what began to happen? People who were Jews, people who were fire worshippers, people who were uh, Christians, people who were uh, Buddhists and this type of thing, they began to enter into Al-Islam. And when they entered into Islam, they came with their baggage, meaning their false beliefs. They tried to enter them into Al-Islam. They tried to bring them and try to corrupt the religion, the enemies of Allah. They recognize we can't attack this ummah like this. We have to try and attack it from within. We have to try and destroy it from within. So they tried to impart and insert falsehood into the religion from within. And so what happened, Ya Ikhwan? You had people lying about the Prophet wasallam, saying this is his hadith. This is like this. This is what he said. So what developed? What developed? The science of hadith. The sciences of hadith, usulul hadith, ulumul hadith, mustalahul hadith. These sciences, they developed why? Because people are lying about the Prophet So now we need to know, is what this person is saying correct or is he a liar? Because when you're attributing something to the Messenger of Allah, this is a problem now. So the science of hadith it developed. Likewise, the science of fiqh developed. To teach you new people who are entering into Islam, welcome to the religion. This is how you pray. This is how you fast. This is how you make hajj. So the science of fiqh, usulul fiqh, it developed. And likewise, the sciences of studying aqeedah also developed. Does everybody understand this? Is there any misconception in anybody's mind? That the scholars didn't bring something new. Because if somebody says, you know this Tawheed, we get this now a lot, we hear it a lot. This Tawheed which you are teaching, it's not mentioned by the Prophet wasallam. It's not mentioned by the companions. It's an innovation, they say. We say, SubhanAllah, what about the uh, Sahih Hadith which you use? What about the Hassan Hadith which you use? Is this also an innovation? What about the science of Tajweed, which teaches somebody to t recite the Book of Allah in the right way? Is that also now an innovation? Because that wasn't around at the time of the Prophet But rather, the scholars developed this science in order to allow us to understand and practice our religion in a more complete way. Does everybody understand this? Is everybody with me so far? Yeah. Good. So, I'll just going, I'm just going to mention a couple of books of Aqeedah, which people might say, well, the earliest book was written 
a hundred years ago, it's something that you people have bought new. Kitab al-Sunnah. Kitab al-Sunnah of Ibn Abi Asim. He died in the year 287 after Hijrah. He died in the year 287 after Hijrah. Then you have, uh, for example, Kitab al-Tawheed. We're, we're speaking about Tawheed, are we not? Kitab al-Tawheed, it was written by Ibn Khuzaymah and he died in the year 311. Look, earliest generations of Al-Islam. Kitab al-Tawheed, somebody comes and says, you have just bought it a hundred years ago from Saudi Arabia. We say, no, uh, Kitab al-Tawheed, a book like, titled like this, it was written by Abba, uh, Imam uh, Ibn Khuzaymah who died in the year 311. Kitab al-Qadr, what do we believe about predestination and the decree? It was written by Al-Firyabi, who died in the year 301. Imam Ahmad, we all know Imam Ahmad. He wrote a book, Al-Rad ala Zanadika wal Jahmiya, a refutation on the Jahmiya and these other people who went astray. He died in the year 241 after Hijrah. So look from the earliest generation, I'm trying to show you that the scholars, just like the scholars of Hadith, and they wrote and they collected the ahadith. They are scholars who spoke about at tawheed So then, Ikhwan, what we need to know is that for ease of study, the scholars broke down tawheed into three parts. The scholars, they divided the oneness of Allah for three into three parts in order to make it easier for us to understand. So when you go to your lay Muslim brother, He's not like the companions, he's not like Abu Bakr. You can't just give him an ayah and he understands everything about that ayah from that, uh, you know, about that, uh, uh, from, about Tawheed from that one ayah. You have to explain it to him. In order to explain it, the scholars divided Tawheed into how many categories? Three. Three categories. The first category is the oneness of Allah in His Lordship. The oneness of Allah in His Lordship. If you want it, it's called Tawheed al rububiyyah Tawheed al rububiyyah The oneness of Allah in His Lordship. Who can tell me what that means? Does anybody know what Tawheed al rububiyyah is? The Lordship of Allah, yes, Akhi? The creator, the owner, the control of the world. In a, in, 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 a, in a more summarized way, it means we recognize that Allah is alone in His actions. The things that Allah does, He's alone in that. Does anybody create alongside Allah? Does anybody sustain, send down the rain, give life and give death besides Allah? No. Does anybody control what happens in the creation besides Allah? No. But why is it necessary for us to study such a thing? Because you have people like the Shia who say that the 12 Imams, they control the creation. But if a person understands Tawheed, he says, no, this, this goes against the first category of Tawheed. How can somebody share in the creation and the command of the creation alongside Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That means you've set up a partner. That means you have committed shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do we understand? So it's in order to understand. The second category is the oneness of Allah in His names and in His attributes. Tawheed al-Asma'i wa sifat The oneness of Allah in His names and in His attributes. Is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like us? A question for you. Is He a man? Is he, does He share our characteristics? Of course, any Muslim is going to say no. Allah is unique. So then, when you see this and then you see the Christians and they've painted God in their words as an old man with a beard, then of course you know that this is going against the creed of Al-Islam. When you, you hear about Isa السلام, being the son of God, then you know that this goes against the names and the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Likewise with the names and the attributes of Allah, if somebody said to you, describe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, describe your Lord, the one who created you, the one who you worship, the one who sustains you, describe Him. 
The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam told us Allah has 99 names, 100 minus 1. Whoever memorizes them and lives by them, then he will have Jannah. So you want to know about Allah? You have the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to study, to learn about your Creator subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the third category is Tawheed al uluhiyya or Tawheed al ibadah Makes it easy for you brothers insha'Allah. Tawheed al ibadah and the, na- and the clue is in the name that Allah is the only one who we worship. But you need to know that worship isn't just sajda. There's much more and we're going to look at that in a bit more detail. Bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. Today, in the time left, we're going to look at the proofs for this first category of Tawheed. Remember we said that the scholars, they derived these three categories. Number one, to help us to understand. Number two, where did they get them from? They got them from the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Prophet So, Brother Abu Ibrahim, now you have made a claim that this is from the Book of Allah, that Allah is the Creator and the Sustainer and the one who decides our affairs. Now you need to bring your evidence. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in Surah Az-Zumar, Surah number 39, Ayah number 62, Allahu khaliku kulli shay. Allah is the creator of all things, wa huwa ala kulli shay'in wakil. And He is the disposer of the affairs. So who created everything, ya ikhwan? Allah jalla wa ala. Who is the one who controls the affairs? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who can give me another one? Tawheed al rububiyya Allah is the owner and the sustainer and the creator of all things. So simple, the answer is in front of your faces when you stand in salah. What is it? What do we read? Every prayer, what do we read? Rabbil alameen rububiyya comes from this Rabb. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all praise, all perfect praise is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Rabb of the Alameen, the Creator, the Sustainer, the, 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 the Lord of all of the world subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah jalla wa ala, He also says, Alhamdulillahi fatir samawati wal ard. All praise is to Allah, the Creator of the heavens and the earth. Are we now getting an understanding where the scholars took this first category of Tawheed from? Those ayat which they have grouped and said, this group of ayahs, this group of verses, it talks about the oneness of Allah in His actions. Meaning the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does, He has no partners in that at all. وَلِلَّهِ مُلْكُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ And to Allah belongs the heavens, the dominions of the heavens and the earth. إِنَّ رَبَّكُمُ اللَّهُ الَّذِي خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Indeed your Lord is Allah the one who created the heavens and the earth. أَلَا لَهُ الْخَلْقُ وَالْأَمْرِ Indeed for Allah is the creation and the command. What's the command mean here, ya ikhwan? Allah says, لَهُ الْخَلْقُ وَالْأَمْرِ What is the command? What, what's that mean? To Allah belongs the creation and His is the command, meaning He has the command of what happens in His creation. He decides what happens in your life. He decides what happens in His creation, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there are many other ayat, perhaps at the beginning of next lesson, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala, we will talk about these. So. Brothers, Tawheed al-Rububiyya is to recognize Ifradullahi Ta'ala fi Af'alihi, the singling out of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in His actions. Meaning He does these things and nobody else has any share in that along with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Now I've got a question for you, Ikhwan. Recognizing this category, Recognizing Allah created me, recognizing Allah sustains me, recognizing Allah is the one who provides for me and He controls my life. Does this make you a Muslim? Here's a question for you. Saying, I have a man here now and he says, Allah is the one who created me 
and we say, and who sends down this rain from the sky? Who's the one that provides for you? He says, Allah. And then we have the one who says, Allah gives the one who gives life and death. And we have the one who's, and he says, Allah decides what happens in my life. Does that enter him into Islam? No. 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 That doesn't enter that person into Al Islam. But to find out why, come again next week, bi idnillahi ta'ala, and we will go into it into more detail. Rather, I don't want to uh, rush it uh, because we need to give this uh, topic its due weight. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu wa la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.